Welcome to Sexology, a podcast that untangles the science of sex and pleasure. And now, with this week's episode, your host, clinical psychologist, Dr. Nazanin Moali. Hello and welcome to episode 87 of Sexology Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Nazanin Moali. Today we're going to talk about our relationship with our body and how it impacts our sexuality and how it impacts what we experience as pleasure inside and outside the bedroom. And also we're going to talk about how society plays a role and what we see and think is sexy and what we can do to change it if that's the, that is a narrative that's not working for us. Our guest today is Ms. Sonali Rashadwar, MSW, LCSW, MED, is an award-winning social worker, sex therapist, adjunct lecturer, and grassroots organizer. Based in Philly, she's a fat, queer, non-binary therapist working as a sexual violence crisis counselor, specializing in treating sexual trauma, body image issues, racial and immigrant identity issues, and South Asian family systems while offering fat and body positive sexual health care. Popularly known as the fat sex therapist on Instagram, their fame hit an all-time high when they were featured in Breitbart in March 2018 for naming thinness as a white supremacist beauty ideal. Sonali is South after speaker who travels nationally to curate custom visual workshops that whisper to our change-making spirit and nourish our vision for a more just future. Sonali received the Master of Social Work and Master of Education in Human Sexuality from Widener University, I hope I'm saying it right, 2016, and have been working in the field of anti-violence for more than seven years. Here's my conversation with Ms. Sonali Rashadwar. Hello and welcome to another episode of Sexology Podcast. I am honored and very excited to welcome Mrs. Sonali Rashadwar to our show today. Sonali, welcome to our show. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so quick question. <laughs> Did I say it right? Did I pronounce your name right? <laughs> or, or, and also, is it Miss or Mrs.? <laughs> because as I said it, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> we, we talked about this via email. <laughs> Just Miss, Miss Sonali Rashadwar. Awesome. Awesome. Welcome to our show today. I am very excited about our conversation because if I'm honest with you, this is a topic that before reading about your work and kind of like doing a little bit of research on that, this is not the topic that was like in forefront of my mind. And that's something I'm not, I haven't thought about it as much, which is so important. And I feel very passionate about social justice. So I feel a little bit embarrassed about that. <laughs> so I know one of the workshops and the training and the area of interest that you have is around sexual colonization. Can you tell us a little bit about this concept for our listeners that they might, might like me, might not be familiar with it? Absolutely. So I am a social worker by training. And what that means is in order to become a therapist as a social worker, I had to go to grad school. And so when I was in graduate school, and this was about five years ago, maybe a little bit longer, I was not seeing myself, meaning my family, my community, my ethnicity, my race, my heritage, my ancestors, reflected in the history that was taught in a lot of the courses, nor was my ethnicity represented in a lot of the teachings on theory. So like, who are the theorists who are being published and who are who is being heralded as like modern day pushing the conversation forward? So to me, I was seeing like this predominance of white, cisgender, heterosexual theorists and thinkers and scholars as this form of colonization. Because I know that there are more than just white people talking about sexuality and talking about what can be healthy for us and feel good for us and be pleasurable and how family systems can look differently 
and how people within our genders and sexual orientations can exist throughout the spectrum. And those people are not just white people talking about this and talking about it in a positive, helpful, productive, healthy way. And so it was through not seeing myself reflected in the curriculum that I started to understand a lot of this is a form of white supremacy and is a form of colonialism where we're only seeing one narrow narrative being represented. And so I, that was when I started searching for who are the other people who are not white, who are not cisgender, not heterosexual, talking about sexuality in ways that really relate to me. And that is entirely where my interests and my, my research interests also lie just in wanting to rep being able to represent myself in the curriculum, in the literature, in the research, and also to make sure that there are services that I would want to access. So like, if I'm a, a person looking for a therapist, I have a difficult time because it's hard to find someone who is going to talk about social justice issues, who is fat positive and not going to say that weight loss should be one of my treatment goals, and also who understands my family system. Coming from a more Asian, Eastern fam family-centered, more collectivist, community-centered way of operating, I need a clinician who really understands that it's hard for me to assert my individuality. So my the purpose of my work is to make space for me and people who are like me within research, within client populations, so that clinicians know, you know, what kind of stuff we need if they're going to work with someone like me. I love that. And yes, and yes, and yes, yes. to all of that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad that makes sense. <laughs> because, you know, I'm also a woman of color. I'm Iranian, as our listeners know. And and I'm, I'm cisgender. It's not even, you know, it's a as a woman of color, cisgender, I, I kind of share the same perspective that mm -hmm. you shared with us around like some of the theories and things you learn in graduate school and through the lenses that you learn mm -hmm. to see clients. And again, in some contexts, in particular for clientele, that might work, but it's not mm -hmm. inclusive of everyone. And also, when it comes with sex education and sexuality, that even get narrower. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yes. So I guess when you were doing the research, because this, this, this is something I've noticed, but I never did research on other voices and other theories and things that are going on, especially around sexuality, were you able to find that there were other voices that hasn't been kind of portrayed or highlighted, or there's just lack of research, like looking through this thing from different lenses? There's a little bit of both. So one is that the folks who get, who get the praise, who get the recognition for being leaders in generalizable theory are going to be white folks. And in thinking about how, just like you said, like we can't always generalize a lot of the research that we find when it comes from a white perspective, because it doesn't necessarily cover a lot of non-white folks and folks of color. What I found is that within research methodologies, even those have to be decolonized in the way that we understand the way that research and the way that education is different from community to community. So I have found that not only was there a lack in uplifting the theorists of color and scholars of color work, there is also a devaluation in the scholars of color work that doesn't exist within the academy, or that there's this narrow idea of what we can recognize as valid, generalizable, understanding of how an individual psychology can work because it came up from someone who has such a very niche individual set of identities, like a fat, non-binary, Black person has written a lot of work and a lot of my understanding on fat identity, but she's not someone who has a master's degree. She's not someone who has published within the academy. And a lot of her stuff is available freely online through blogs, through Facebook status updates, through articles that I can find for free, but you'll never see her published in, in a paper. But a lot of what my understanding on how to understand my fat identity, how to understand fat trauma, 
as a collective experience by almost 70% of the population of the U.S. that exists within a higher weight category. A lot of this is like devaluation. And then, of course, like you and I both know, there is a dearth of research, but it's not it's not that it doesn't exist and that we just need more people to be interested in doing research on our own people, Iranians, South Asians, folks of color in general, but it's that they're not being uplifted and being taught as generalizable work because it's not studying white folks or black folks or Latinx folks, which are considered like a very high demand research population right now because a lot of funding is going towards researching Latinx communities within the state. Absolutely. And you're right. Again, I'm thinking more about it right now is that like, you know, if you want to publish an article, you need to kind of belong to a university and the who gets selected to get certain universities, who gets mentorship and all of that is just like continuously kind of more biased toward part of like a specific part of population. And for someone with different background, different life experiences, it might not be as readily available to get mm-hmm. through those paths and get through those kind of funnels through kind of get published in peer reviewed journals. So it, all of these things can contribute to what we get as research. Absolutely. And so whenever I talk about scholars who I have learned from, who really helped me to understand that perspective or that theory or this really big concept like capitalism or neoliberalism, I will name them as scholars, even if they don't have master's degrees, even if they've never been published, even if they don't have this professional career in promoting academic knowledge. And the person who I was mentioning before, her name is Ashley Shackelford, and she is like a prolific writer and has helped many individuals help to understand what the fat identity experiences in places like here in the U.S. Absolutely. And again, I'm not familiar with her work, but I love to read more about it because part of my work is working with eating disorders. And it's just so interesting that, again, I might see more of it in my clientele, but I see it everywhere, even with my clients, that they're coming in for issues around their sexuality and low desire. And part of it, they feel they don't deserve pleasure because their body is not a certain kind of body. Yes. And that is the number one correlation that I also see in my work and my practice with individuals who experience any type of body shame, body image dissatisfaction, or like body image distortion. Oftentimes they are also engaged in disordered eating and not necessarily within a body size that you might assume is someone who is having an eating disorder. So I see lots of fat clients who a regular doctor, mainstream doctor may never think, oh, this is someone with an eating disorder. But these are fat individuals who are restricting for the purpose of becoming into a smaller body size. And this is an idea that I I actually learned from another author. Her name is Virgie Tovar. And she just actually released a, a book that is really helpful in understanding fat phobia and diet culture. And the title of her book that just came out was You Have the Right to Remain Fat. Mm -hmm. And in this book, she writes a lot about how diet culture creates these two categories of people. You're either performing good health behaviors or you're not performing good health behaviors. And if you're not performing them, then the public, the general public, has the right to dehumanize you, to treat you poorly and to not treat you well. And in this book, she talks about how eating disorders only exist in places where it is not okay to be fat, and it does not exist in other places where it is great to be fat. Eating disorders only exist when it is unsafe, when we know and acknowledge that there are fat people receive extremely bad treatment, and we need to avoid it at all costs. I can talk about this for hours. <laughs> As you're talking about, my blood is boiling from anger because, again, my clients with eating disorders and I always talk about, you know, it's not the, so, someone's body it doesn't 
necessarily show whether they're struggling, how much of an eating disorder they're struggling or not. And I have clients in the past and I had clients that they were in the bigger bodies and they were restricting. And it was hard to find even residential facilities that they accept them because of their body size, because it wasn't within certain kind of frame. And I think as as a society, this issue of fat phobia is going mm. so deep. So I, I hear you on that. And I think it's just people often are very misinformed, even physicians and just like things and the comments they feel it's uh, helpful is actually make things worse. Oh, and what I've been telling a lot of my clients is that, first of all, I've been naming it. I've been naming it as medical oppression. Mm hmm. The experience of going to a medical professional who you should be trusting, who you should be being honest with, who you should be telling vulnerable details about your health and everyday life to, when that medical professional diminishes your, your symptoms, makes you feel like they don't believe you for having those symptoms, or dehumanizes you based on body size, that is not a medical professional who is, who is thinking about you as a whole person or wants to care for you as a whole person. So weight bias can often be something that comes in between a medical professional and us as, as overweight, fat, obese, which is not a word that I like to use, um, but obese feels like um, the hyper-medicalization of fat. Like it doesn't necessarily need to be so medicalized, but it, it happens in a lot of medical spaces. So two really good interventions I've been using, which I'm sure you do with your clients as well, is if being weighed on a scale is preventing someone from going to see a doctor, which was the case for me. It was preventing me from seeing a doctor for years, mm -hmm. at least three years. And I was, avoid I was avoiding it and I was terrified because I was afraid that when I get on that scale, that number, I knew that when I would see that number, because I don't know what that number is, I do not own a scale. I knew that if I saw that number, it was going to like drive me into this negative place for weeks or months at a time, and it would be difficult for me to pull myself out of. So a really simple intervention that I have been using personally is, and I, and I encourage all of my clients to use, is that when I go to a doctor's office, before they put me on the scale, I simply say, I would prefer not to be weighed today. And simply saying that alone, I have not had any pushback. Every person who I've said it to has said, okay, no problem. And then we walk into uh, the area where I have like blood pressure reading and things like that. And it has been a tremendous help in me going to seek medical care for the things that I, I need to be going in routinely for. So I always give that as the first intervention idea. If being weight is going to prevent you from going in and seeking medical help, then you don't have to do it, especially if you don't medically need that number for any reason. Like it's not going to be used for dosing medication or it's not going to be, it's not super important for us to know like how much uh, edema has been built up somewhere in our bodies. And so we're, we're monitoring weight for that reason. The second thing that I, I always recommend folks is visual diet. So if we are thinking about consciously all of the types of bodies that we visually consume in our days, weeks, months, through print media, through social media, psychologically, all of those bodies that we visually consume establishes a norm within our minds. And if we're not seeing ourselves represented in our visual diet, we are more likely to consider ourselves someone who exists outside of the norm. So this is a really helpful intervention, especially for individuals who have like a body part that, that they have a really hard time accepting. So for me, it was my super fat, plushy, squishy, soft arms. And it took me a while to finally be able to have such positive adjectives to associate with my arms. But it required me to add images of happy, fat people with fat arms into my social media visual diet so that I could see myself represented and I could see my body as something that deserves love and care and a partner and eroticization and sexualization that feels consensual to me and things like that. 
I love that. And I think with not <laughs> waiting part is like, I, I that's something I even at times I advocate for my clients, calling their physician, saying that like this is the struggle. And actually as a provider, I, I feel I get more pushback. So <laughs> oh, <laughs> hearing that client yeah, saying it might be more helpful because when I say that and they say, you know, we don't do blind waiting, we don't do this and that. And oh I just, goodness. yeah, it's interesting. Maybe it's a LA thing, but again, I understand that they might need that information, but also then oftentimes, at least based on what I hear from my clients, that gets followed with a 20 minute lecture of weight loss when they just oh came in for like sore throat, which is so <laughs> uncalled for. So I, I love the idea of like you, you being at a place of saying that this is not helpful for me and I don't want to know and they're honoring it. Yep. It's, it's been successful for me, thankfully, and I hope that anyone who uses it also feels success and experiences experiences success when they use it. And the other thing I'm thinking, which I love the second intervention that you mentioned about kind of visual diet, because again, most of the this Instagram models and Facebook models, and I talk to my clients about <laughs> them, that they're Photoshop and they're just like so struggling. Most of them, I can even visually can see they're struggling with disorder eating and eating disorder and all of that. And that kind of plays into people's understanding of what sexy body is. And as an individual, like if someone that's in the bigger size and they want to kind of reorient reorient their understanding of what what is a sexy body looks like and kind of changing their internal dialogue, what are some of the recommendations you have for our listeners around that? Absolutely visual diet. Number one, if if in our minds we are having a hard time seeing a fat body as sexy, as healthy, as desirable, as attractive, as worthy of love and appreciation and attention and admiration, it's really important to have those visual images within our diet. So I can name a couple of Instagram accounts just off the top of oh, my great. head that include like fat, unairbrushed, bodies that are displaying like sexy, desirable, attractive, and also a wide range of fatness where you're not going to see necessarily if if we're talking about fatness as a spectrum, you're not going to see as many small fats as you might see medium or super fats or even infinity fats, which is towards the, the larger end of the spectrum. And some accounts that I'm thinking of include Shuglet, and Shuglet is Shug McDaniels, who is an article in, I'm sorry, a photographer based in Florida and photographs extremely exquisite images, like beautifully artfully crafted images of, of super duper fat bodies and individuals interacting with fat bodies in ways that promote the fat body and it feels like acceptance and the way that they create these artful images. Another Instagram account that I think of is Ashley Chubby Bunny. And Ashley Chubby Bunny is an activist, I consider her a fat activist, based in New York City. And she posts images prolifically, like tens of images daily about that that show, that visually show fat bodies in different positions, fat bodies in intimate, less clothed, like underwear type things, bathing suits, like more, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> more exposed, like mm -hmm. uh, less, less uh, covered up. So also that helps to, for me, when I see bodies like that, it helps for me to see like, oh, I don't have to cover my body up in order to prevent someone else from being offended just by my body existing. Another account that I can think of would include, sorry, dead air. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you have all of this information top of your head, mine. I was like. <laughs> there are so many, you know, Insta I really, really rave Instagram because there are so many incredible registered dietitians who I have found and nutritionists and food bloggers and therapists 
who post these incredible memes that are really uplifting. And I repost them and I write short clips about them. Like I think about um, this podcaster. So there's a podcast, another one, just like yours, that's uh, very popular called Food Psych. And Christy Harrison is the person who runs it. And she just creates these like snippets from the people who do the podcast, like these little quotes. Mm -hmm. And they're very uplifting. And a lot of other registered dietitians on Instagram do the similar concept. Obviously, I'm going to self-promote right now because I can't think of another person, but sure. you can follow me. I am on Instagram as the fat sex therapist, and I repost a lot of dietitians within my story. And I only post things that feel body positive, fat positive, affirming, uh, non-judgmental, and always affirm the right for client self-determination. So that means for us to make the choices that feel best for our body, despite how it might look to someone else or the public on the outside of that decision. And I think this is great to kind of like filter and detox the accounts on your social media. Because again, I was telling my clients that are younger even that like, you know, getting exposed to these things as, as you talked about can, it's not helping with your confidence. It's not helping with your recovery. So it's very important to kind of like get rid of those kind of accounts that are not empowering and it's not uplifting. But also I feel the issue goes Beyond that, like as and I know you talked about it in one of your talks about sex education and how even in the sex education, there's just only certain kind of bodies are getting portrayed and people getting exposed to these images very, very young. So what can we do to create more like body inclusive sex education? So first of all, we have to acknowledge that different size bodies exist and they deserve to exist. And Whenever we are creating sex education and we're using words like obesity or somehow in our curriculum, there are like we really have to scour a lot of our curriculum that comes pre-made for us. And if there is stuff in the curriculum that is saying these are the types of these are the number of calories one should be eating per day. These are the types of foods one should be eating per day. If food is being moralized in our curriculum and saying things like. These are good foods and healthy foods. These are junk foods and these are unhealthy foods. And we should try to avoid unhealthy foods whenever possible. As sex educators, it is our responsibility to make sure that we are always promoting positive body image and not contributing to someone else's eating disorder. And that means us being responsible educators and scouring that content, making sure that if the content has holes in it, and if it's not saying positive stuff about body image or affirming that thought bodies exist and deserve to exist, then we need to do that work on our own and find those individuals who are doing that work and saying those things. Because fat sex educators of color exist. I'm here to tell you that they exist. There are many people like me who are doing this work. I'm not the only one. And all we have to do is find a meme that they've created, find a quote that they've shared, find an article that they might have written in some content. And all I do when I teach a workshop is I will add one slide that talks a little bit about this hole in the literature or this hole in the curriculum. And in, within that one slide, I have identities that feel affirmed by students that are in my classroom or a client that I'm sitting with Every time that we can affirm someone, someone's existence and their right to exist exactly as they are, we negate the negative self-talk that exists inside of them. We quiet that internal self-critic and we promote the higher self that has a lot of these like positive affirmations that we want to be saying to ourselves. And so when we affirm someone's positive body image, we also promote their ability to consent to sex that they want to be having. We affirm their ability to withdraw consent from sex that they want to stop having. We affirm their ability to advocate for themselves while they're having sex, to have the kind of sex that they want to be having. When we address body image dissatisfaction as 
one of the root issues for a lot of a of someone's individual ability to navigate a sexually intimate experience, we actually affect their ability to have assertive communication in so many other parts of their life too. Like one really great intervention, and it's kind of like a challenge that I offer to some of my clients when we're working on assertive communication is the challenge of going to a coffee shop and giving your order without apologizing. And it has to be a super complicated order. Like it has to be um, with almond milk and, you know, uh, two pumps of caramel syrup. I'm sorry, I don't drink coffee, so I don't know much about coffee ordering. But <laughs> and uh, and without foam and can you have it be, you know, three quarters filled and um, I'd only like uh, this type of sugar. And when we have this really complicated order and we don't feel bad about asking for that and advocating for ourselves, that is a successful challenge in assertive communication. I love that. And I think, again, because of this constant bombarding people with bigger bodies around and shaming them around who they are, it can kind of impact their communication. It can impact how they see themselves, even in the bedroom. And I'm thinking mm -hmm. about, I talk about it with my clients all the time, is like, for example, if you get a gift that you love, you do the best to take care of it. You make sure it's a good place. But if you get a crappy gift that you don't want it, you just throw it aside. And it's <laughs> the same with your body, right? So if it's think it's wonderful and it's beautiful, you would take care of it. And you you want to make sure you do things and kind of like do things that gives you pleasure. And you don't want to treat your body, yeah, as like a crappy gift that you're just hiding <laughs> it with this like loose clothing and you want to be invisible. Right. And the the fear of experiencing fat phobia affects everybody across the board. It's not necessarily that folks in fatter bodies experience it more greatly or are paralyzed by it in any, any more way. Like my nine to five work is within the field of sexual trauma. And that's my wheelhouse. I really, I, I thrive within trauma work. And I have a really great understanding of fat trauma from this traumatic lens. And when I hear from my clients that they experience what I have been calling body image trauma within their relationships, it's almost like, and it's from thin clients who have said this to me, they express that there is pressure within the relationship to remain a certain body size. There is pressure within the relationship, either implicit or explicit, to continue performing what I call good health behaviors. And that means going to the gym on a regular basis, eating certain types of foods on a regular basis, as well as avoiding other types of foods on a certain basis. It also means surrounding yourself by people who look like this aspirational body and avoiding surrounding yourself with people who don't look like that aspirational body. And I consider that a form of body image trauma and body image abuse. People who feel pressure and feel manipulation within a relationship to maintain a certain body size, that I would consider that abusive. And that is primarily because I work in a field and my nine to five work is within sexual trauma. And so I have a good eye for what is considered an abusive dynamic within a relationship where one person has more power than someone else, or there's a system that is emitting oppressive signals from this place and position of power. I don't know if it's a term that maybe it's already been used before. I don't claim to have invented it, but I think it's a really helpful way of understanding the pressure of diet culture and the way that it affects all of us uniformly. And I think the other piece of that, I know many of our listeners are therapists, and I think it's important to kind of challenge your way of thinking and the the feedback that you get on different cases. And I can talk about it in, based on my experience. You know, I do consultation and get consultation on different cases and like paid consultation and supervision. And I was talking about a challenging case with someone and I was telling the person that, you know, this client, the, the partner, the husband feels lack of desires after childcare. And like we're talking about how the body, the husband was saying that the body changed after the childbirth. 
And I was just asking mm. consultation and the person immediately went that, oh, well, then she needs to lose weight. Did you <gasps> call her to do this and that? No. And I was like, I was furious. And again, usually I'm not confrontational. <laughs> and, and this was a seasoned person. I was like, you know, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> and this is not going to be I, helpful. I <laughs> And again, I, I I was feeling conflicted because yes, there you are, like asking for kind of questions from someone that you consider an expert. But I think these issues are going so deep. Like we as a clinicians at times are guilty of that, kind of not being aware of our biases around body Absolutely. and the diet culture. Absolutely. I this is such a common case example. I hear it a lot of times at, at workshops that I teach where there are a lot of therapists in the audience. And it's one that a lot of clinicians who haven't done a lot of excavation of their internal weight bias struggle with. But the answer is pretty simple, right? Like if you love your wife, then you have to adjust what you think is attractive. Because if you want to love your wife and you want to think that she's attractive, that's an internal psychology adjustment. Mm -hmm. And it is not a request where we're asking her to change her body. So it's like inherently, it's like, it's, it feels abusive. It feels like a misconstruing of power. It feels like patriarchy. It feels like, it feels like an inappropriate request. Absolutely. And I think it's at times I feel it's reductionistic of what eroticism and sexuality yes. is is much more than your body and like what your body shape is. It just so much goes into our sexuality and our intimacy with our partners and ourselves. And and it's just, again, like a losing the weight. I highly doubt that would be the, uh, even if even <laughs> if we were going to that direction would be the answer. Right, if it's even possible. Like a lot of these assumptions, a lot of the, whenever we put weight loss on our treatment goals, there's this like false assumption that people even have that kind of control over their bodies. And diet culture taught us that. Diet culture teaches us everyone uniformly has the same, this same amount of control over their bodies. They are able to control their weight in this really specific way. But that is not true. Not all of us are operating within diet culture with the same health experiences. So, you know, genetically what I've inherited is super different from the next person. And that has to mean that my body is going to look different because of what I've inherited genetically as opposed to someone else. That means that my health trajectories are going to look different. And sometimes no matter what I eat and no matter how I exercise, I'm going to still develop type 2 diabetes or high blood pressure or cholesterol. And performing good health behaviors doesn't necessarily have to be at the top of my priority list. It's something that I can be working towards, but I don't have to always be working to prevent acquiring a disability because it's not always even possible. So now I can talk to you about it for hours. <laughs> Obviously, we have so much common interest, but we're toward the end of our time. I, I want to make sure that our listeners, they know where they can find you, where, where they can get access to your wonderful workshop. So tell us a little bit about uh, what are some of the ways to get in contact with you? Sure. So there are two, two of the best ways to get in contact with me include first my website. So if I've said anything that you loved, that you hated, or you found super duper offensive, I would love to know. My website is sonalier.com and that's spelled S-O-N-A-L-E-E-R.com. I have a contact form and you can send me a thorough message about what you thought the second way to get in contact with me is to follow my Instagram page. And on my Instagram, I post a lot of these snippets that I was talking about where we uplift the higher self and we push down the negative self-talk or we erase or evaporate or overshadow the negative self-talk through a lot of different methods. I, I recently posted like a great visual graphic about what are considered diet culture, health behaviors, and internal health behaviors. So weight or body size would be like a diet culture health behavior versus an internal health behavior would be like, do I feel good? Have I eaten enough to feel satisfied and full? So like memes like that. And you can find me on Instagram, the same handle that I've mentioned before. 
It is the fat sex therapist. And that's on Instagram. Awesome. And if you guys are driving or you didn't get a chance to write it down, I'll leave all these links to the show notes so you can just go there and find her. And thank you so much for your time and <laughs> being so generous with these great interventions. And oh again, I, I hope to talk to you soon. You are incredible. I have Aww. never been on a podcast before that felt so affirming. I really appreciate this. Thank you so much for having oh, me. Thank you so much for your kind words. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Sonali. I love how passionate she is about social justice and helping us to have a better understanding of diet culture and what it does to our sexuality. And I want to invite you guys to kind of think more about topics that and interventions she uh, suggested. And I know this is a sensitive topic for many people because many of us grew up with the idea of there's something wrong with you if you're in a bigger body and you have to correct it. And at times I feel some of us feel our purpose in life is just to pay bills and get smaller. And as you know, there's so much more in life than those things. And I want you to take action today to feel better about your body and in the size that it is right now and honor it for all the wonderful things that's capable of doing and the pleasure that it can give you. Because again, oftentimes I hear from my clients that they feel they're not uh, worthy of pleasure or their body is not worth taking care of because of they feel shame about their size. So again, that's my invitation to kind of think about whenever you hear this negative internal dialogue, kind of challenge yourself by saying that whose voice is that? And whether is this thought helping me or hurting me? And again, the more we do these kind of things, the easier it gets for us to change this internal narrative. At the end, I want to ask for a favor from all of you. So if you you have been listening to this show and you enjoy it, it means a lot to me if you write an honest review on Apple Podcasts. The more reviews we get, the more subscription we get, uh, we rank higher in iTunes. And again, my number one goal is reach as many people as possible and provide the sex education that many of us never received. Anyhow, I'll talk to you guys next week. And thank you so much for listening. Thanks for listening to Sexology Podcast. For more great content, visit www.sexologypodcast.com. Please be advised that information presented on this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health provider.